state class is purely application. We're going to look at PLS, particularly its predictive ability. Uh, and while we're going through that, you'll hope to learn about some good data analysis practice. Okay, so let's just recap from last class. Um, where, we, where we were at is we've got these two data matrices, X and Y. And the PLS algorithm, the details algorithm, while it is, is a step up in complexity from PCA, isn't really that much more involved conceptually. There's nothing new that you need to understand from a concept point of view. What PLS is doing is it's trying to explain this X matrix using the scores T. Um, and so you, you could look at the PLS algorithm as trying to maximize T transpose T, in other words, the variance explained in those, in those scores T, the variance coming from the X matrix. And those scores are calculated from the weights W. We've also got the Y space, which is being explained. We're trying to maximize how well we can explain the Y space with U transpose U, which are the projections onto the loadings in the, for the Y space C. So C are our loadings for the Y space. We project the Y variables onto those loading directions, calculate the scores in U, and we want to maximize that variance explained in U. But it's also trying to do a third thing at the same time. And that's re maximize this relationship between x and y. And we showed last class that that comes down to maximizing the correlation between t and u. So for our correlation between t and u, we're trying to maximize that. We're trying to maximize t transpose t, the variance explained in the x space, and u transpose u, the variance explained in the y space. And that product of those terms is exactly the covariance of t versus to u. So the objective function in PLS is to maximize covariance between the T vector and the U vector. The objective function for PCA is trying to maximize the variance between T and T, T and T T. So variance and covariance are, this, are, are analogous. PCA is trying to maximize the covariance of T with itself. PLS is trying to maximize the covariance of T with U. Okay, so it's really it all fits into the same framework. We're just changing what we're putting in our objective function. So we're always trying to maximize some covariance, it's just what, what two terms go in that covariance. Uh, and geometrically, <coughs> we, uh, we can try and visualize that by saying for our x space, we've got a y space. This direction vector in the x space is what we call w, the weights for the, for the x space. The direction vector in the y space is c. And the scores in the x space t are the direct the distances along that vector w, and the u's are the distances along the vector. Okay, and so the Niedel's algorithm proceeds with a series of these arrow diagrams. Uh, so in PCA, the diagram that you have in mind, you just basically remove the right hand side over here, and we're just flipping between t and and the, the loadings until convergence. With NEPELs, we extend that arrow uh, diagram through the X matrix and then come back and work through Y, go through its weights, C, and then come back through X and cycle through, through those till convergence. So it's really uh, just uh, two, three extra steps there in the NEPELs for PLS from an, ad, uh, from an algorithm. And I guess the part that might be a little hard to, to, to get the first time, certainly I didn't get this the first time I went through, the, through this entire multivariate course with John Greger, was the relationship between W and W star and P. Okay? So we've got, we've got several matrices in the PLS algorithm corresponding to the X matrix. If you just go back up here, we've got this matrix here, the Ws, which summarize the direction vectors in X that, that get our, our objective function uh, to, to be maximum. But we also have a W star matrix exactly the same size as W. And there's an additional matrix, P. So there's three matrices that kind of define the direction vectors here all for the X vectors, W, W star, and P. And trying to sort out what the three of them are doing and how they're <coughs> similar from each other really is not something is, is not something that's easy to get the first time around, okay? I, like I said, didn't get the 
first time around. I sat in John's class the second time around, and then it started to become clearer. And I think by the time I heard him repeat it a third time, it became so I started to get it. So feel free to use the course videos. You don't have to wait a whole year before sitting in this class again to get it. So maybe you can get it a little sooner this time. But um, the way to explain the difference between W and W stars is, is, is fairly straightforward. What we're doing in the first component is we're getting our scores T by just multiplying x with the w. So that's the standard projection step. We're projecting our x matrix onto the, this direction vector w, and getting those distances in, this, in the score vector t. But then we deflect. We remove from the x matrix the part we've just explained with those scores, okay? Because we want the next component to explain something new and totally orthogonal to what the first component was explaining. And that's why we deflect. We subtract from x0, our, our starting point. We remove from that t times p1. So t times p1 is a matrix that's the same size as x. And it captures the part explained by the first component. So we're removing that. And this is then the residual. That residual, x0 minus t1, p1 transpose, we call that x subscript 1. <coughs> so x1, oh, here, here it is, x1 is our residual matrix over here. And x1 is orthogonal to x0. If you'd say x1 with one component transpose x equals to 0, you'll get a matrix of zeros, indicating that those two spaces are totally orthogonal to each other. Because what's left here in x1 is information that is not explained already by this, this, the, the starting matrix. The residuals are orthogonal to what we started off with. Okay, and then we go ahead and calculate our second score, T2, on that deflated matrix, and that is where we get W2 from. Okay. Now the problem comes when we try and interpret a plot of W1 versus W2. So we have our loadings plot over there, and we'll have various variables variable x1, x2, x3, maybe x4, let's say x5 for simplicity, just five variables. But the w2 direction is based on a deflated matrix. It's not based on the original x matrix. So it really makes it hard to interpret what w2 is doing, and even harder still for w3 and w4, because the, the second component was based on a deflated residual matrix. So what we want is a single matrix, which we were going to call W star, that relates the original data, x0, directly to the scores. Okay? And we calculate W star after the fact. So we first build the, the Nepal's algorithm converges and finishes up. W star is calculated totally after the fact. We don't really need W star from an algorithm point of view. We only use W star from an interpretation point of view try and learn more about what our model is doing. And so when you plot a loadings plot for PLS, by default, the software will plot W star 1 versus W star 2, because you're interpreting that loadings plot. But Nepal's algorithm, nowhere does it rely on this W star matrix at all to do its work. It's purely a conceptual tool that we use to learn more about our model. And once we have W star from this formula, which I can derive for you, but it's not, it's not too complex, <coughs> but there's no need to do that here in this class. We can now go straight from our x space to our scores using W star. In the same way we could go with PCA, we just multiply x by P and we get our t's. In PLS, we can just multiply x now by W star and get our scores. And if you compare these rows here, you can see we get these properties. W star 1 is obviously W1. So for the first component, W and W star are the same. But for second and subsequent components, they, they start to differ. Okay. And where I'm going with this is we ultimately want to use this PLS model on new data. So how do we do that? We've built our model offline <coughs> with the software. Now if we'd like to use it in the future, we're getting an X new vector that we get from our process measurements or, or wherever our source data is, we'd like to end up with some predict prediction of y. 
And so we follow basically the Nihels algorithm. We take our x nu, project it onto this w1 vector to calculate the score value t1 nu. So this t1 nu is a scalar over here, because x nu is a, is a single row vector. So we get a scalar value t1 nu. We deflate our x matrix, uh, sorry, our x nu vector in this case. Remove from that vector the part we've just explained by that score t1. Then we go ahead and calculate t2 on this residual component. So x nu in this third line here is actually the deflated x nu. Multiply it by w2 to get the second score, and we repeat until we get however many components there happen to be in the model, three, four, five, whatever the case might be, we collect those four or five values of the TA subscript mu, collect them together and create a vector called T mu. So that's here in bold. Okay. So now we've got our new scores for this observation X mu. Alternatively, we can go do it all in one go by just multiplying X mu by W star. Okay. So this approach can be used, but if you have missing data in X nu, you have to use this approach up here. If there's missing data in X nu, you can't just go multiply a vector with missing values by a matrix. This is going to just, it's undefined. If there is missing data, we work through this and we, we follow the missing data rules with W, we deflate, calculate the next score, and so on. Okay, but the software takes care of those details for you. If anyone <coughs> is interested in the algorithmic aspect of coding it up, please email me and I can give you a bit more information on this. Uh, but for conceptually, we, we can say that T nu calculated in one go by multiplying it by the W star. Okay. That's clear. Yeah. Question. Sorry, I just, I'm confused the difference between P and W. Okay. So that's, a, that's a, another conceptual difference. The P matrix and the P vector, I unfortunately don't, it's on a pre, on the slides from last part. The, that matrix is calculated purely to deflate x. So after the details algorithm is converged, we then calculate what the p vector is to deflate x. Okay. Perhaps uh, if during the break you give me a chance, I can uh, pull that slide up and then we can talk about it after the break. But um, p's are purely used for explain uh, for capturing the part explained by x. Okay. And it's used then to deflate that x of course. Okay, so, so let's just recap. We get our new x vector, multiply it by the w's, get the scores, deflate with the p's, collect all the scores together. Alternatively we can we can calculate those scores in one go. We still haven't got into y hat yet. We, that's our ultimate aim. We've got our new scores. We can get our y hat now by multiplying uh, y nu by c transpose. So t nu is a, is a row vector of scores, 1 by a. c transpose is, a, is an m by a matrix. So we're going to get m predictions in this vector y nu, one prediction for each column of y. If y is a single column, in other words, if m is equal to 1, then c is a scalar, um, sorry, c is a vector, one entry per component. If, if we've got more than one y, c is a matrix. c itself is an, an m by a matrix. So it's got m rows and a columns, or if m is 1, it's just a row vector with a. Or one other way of getting to your y predicted is just to substitute the definition for t nu, which is x times w star, substitute that in, and we can now go from x nu directly to y nu by, by post multiplying x by w star times c transpose. Now, never implement PLS this way. This is purely for conceptual use, and I'll, I'll uh, because today's class is about predictions and soft senses, this is it's useful for an understanding purpose, but never ever implement PLS this way. I'll show you how to do it properly uh, later on. But this illustrates that we can go from X nu to Y nu predicted in one go. 
the predicted value here is not going to be in the raw original units. You first need to then uncenter and unscale. Actually, this is the wrong way around. You first need to unscale and then uncenter. You do your unpreprocessing in the opposite direction as when you preprocess. So when we preprocess, we first centered and then we scaled. To undo that, you first unscale and then uncenter. So the preprocessing is just repeated back to front. Any questions on that? Most of you are, are kind of on your heads and seem to be Let's just talk about um, one other topic here with PLS, and that's cost validation. How does the software determine the number of components to use? And it's, very, it's, it's exactly analogous to PCA. We calculate this quantity called Q squared, and, it's, and what we do is we split the data in groups. With PCA, we just have a single X matrix, but with PLS now we have two. We split it in exactly the same way. We keep that coherence between the two matrices. Split it perfectly along the rows. And you can choose that row grouping randomly, as I've done in this illustration here. I've done that purely randomly by selection of the order of the groupings. Or you can do, like most software packages, tend to order the, order the cross validation. Rows one, then two, then three, then one, two, three, if you had three groups, or do that G equals seven if you want to group. Five, six, seven, repeat one, three, seven. Or you can do it audit. So do all your row ones, all your row twos, row threes. I'll talk a bit about that later on because how you choose to pick your row ordering can actually uh, influence your, your, your interpretation. As, as will be clear, if I choose a different row ordering, I'm going to get a different Q squared value. Q squared is not like R squared. R squared, there's a, an agreed on definition and one software package will agree with the other software package. If they don't, then there's a bug in the, in the code. But Q squared is not like that at all. Q squared is totally dependent on how you choose your rows here and how you, you group them. Because obviously the rows are different, have different values. Okay, so you can get different Q squared values from different software packages. And in fact, some, some software packages allow you to choose how you specify this ordering. So you can, in some software, you can choose that ordering, or you can choose this ordering, where you do all your group ones, then group twos, then group threes, or they even allow you to import a new column in your data set that you specify how you want your cross validation done. Okay. So if if we pick our groupings like I've done here in this illustration, uh, done them randomly. And I happen to use three groups. I take my data set X and Y. I'm only showing the Y matrix here to save some space. But there's also the X matrix, which is split exactly in the same way as shown here. I'm just showing Y. And I split my X and my Y matrices into, into those three parts. And I keep out group 1. I'm going to use group 1 for testing in the future. And I'm going to build my model on group 2 and 3. So I now take what in this notation here I call x minus 1, the part of the x matrix left over after removing group 1, and I take my y minus 1. And I build a PLS model that relates those two matrices. And from that PLS model, I'll get all my usual outputs. I'll get w's, I'll get p's, uh, c's. Etc. I get the, I get a set of model parameters from building that particular data set uh, from using those sub sub rows. Then I bring in my x one as testing data. Okay. And I use those x one in PLS model <coughs> subscript one. Let's call this PLS model subscript one. I use those x1 as, as new testing data to get y hat. So I predict my, my y's. But of course, I left them out originally over here, so I do know what their real values are. So I compare my predictions of y with the actual values that I omitted here originally. And I call that 
residual matrix F subscript one. So that's a, a small matrix. It's one, one G, one, one G from the data, in this case one third of the data in F. And that's my prediction error for testing group one. Okay. Then I repeat that as, as would be expected for the second group. Leave out the second group, bring in my X subscript two. There's a, there's a hat missing somewhere over here. It's y, y2 minus y hat 2. Predict my second group of y. And there's a hat missing here as well. My third group, y3 minus y3 hat. And what I, what I do after, after I finish <coughs> the G round of cross validation, after the, after the G round, every observation has been left out once. I then take those residual matrices from the Y space. That's the key point here, that that's the key difference from PCA. PCA, those are the residuals from my X matrix. And PLS, these are the residuals from my Y matrix. And I take the sum of squares of the first group, the second group, up until the G group. Compute the sum of squares of those residual blocks. And I call that my prediction error sum of squares or press. Now, the, the, the way I use that press value is I use it in a formula here that defines Q squared, and that the structure of this formula is exactly the same structure as the formula for R squared. So the formula for R squared is one minus the variance of the predicted F when I build my model on all my, my data. But my Q squared formula, that numerator here is just my press, my cross-validated prediction error sum of squares. And I ratio that by the variance, whoops, this, that's a mistake over here. Maybe a copy and paste error. That's the variance of y. Of the variance of x. <coughs> and the same over here, that should be the variance of, of y, not the variance of x. Not sure how that okay. So q squared is defined and calculated and interpreted in the same way as r squared. The only difference is our numerator in that, in that formula is, comes from a cross-validated matrix rather than from one single matrix that we calculate one of those one. That, is that, that clear? That, that should be, if you understood uh, cross-validation for PCA, the only difference here for PLS is that we, we exchanged our X matrix now for our Y matrix. So, the interpretation that you should have in mind for the Q squared from PLS is that it's only looking at your prediction performance of the Y space. Okay, and that actually can be a problem sometimes if your prediction performance of your X space in PLS is of importance to you. But PLS, when in, for all the software packages I've ever used, that Q squared is calculated purely on the Y space's predicted performance. We can calculate Q squared is for single columns from the Y space. And we can, we'll always find that Q squared must be less than the R squared. It would be very unusual to find a Q squared value that does better than when you use all the data. And cross-validation stops adding components when that Q squared increase is small from one component to the next. Q squared will start to go up if we start overfitting our data set, because we're now trying to fit noise to the model. When we bring that testing data in, we're not able to bring that, uh, predict this testing data in this step over here. When we bring this testing data in, and we overfit our model, we're going to start inflating the values of F. So F is not gonna decrease anymore. The usual expectation is that F will decrease as we add components, 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 but at some point, we're going to overfit the model, and we're going to start inflating F. And then when we calculate the sum of squares here, we're going to get a larger value here. So these numbers are going to grow bigger and bigger if we start overfitting. If press gets bigger, we're going to subtract a larger value from 1, causing Q squared to drop off and become smaller. So that's why when Q squared is starting to get small, the incremental Q squared from one component to the next, we're, we're starting to fit noise. That would mean that, um, for instance, we can be overfitting on the X space? You 
can be. Yeah, but so it's it's less. It's not. It's not so likely because PLS has the three objectives: it's trying to maximize x and y to explain as well as the covariance. In very unusual circumstances, will you only be fitting the x and not the y? And that happens when your x matrix contains information that's totally unrelated to y. So the model's trying to maximize the covariance, so it's going to pick one or the other to explain either x or y. Um, so, it, but it's unlikely you're going to put a data set in that, that does that. Now, there is a lot of debate in the in the. What, uh, how many of you are familiar with the word chemo matrix? Uh, okay, so chemo matrix is, is an area where this sort of tool, PLS and PCA, get used. And it was a term, I don't know if it was artificially created to kind of generate some buzz or not, but it, it is a term that's stuck around, that's used a lot in the chemistry community as a, as a way to define this general area of using latent variable methods. So the chemo matrix community has several journals available to them and they publish it. And this topic of cross-validation comes up quite frequently and it's fairly controversial. Some people are total advocates for it, other people are against it, deriving it, uh, deriving it as, as meaningless in some cases. And so this paper here is, is a fairly good read. It's, it's a biased paper to war away from cross-validation. Um, but it, they do describe, if you do it, if you do happen to use cross-validation, what you should be aware of. So I would, I would recommend reading that, especially if any of you are interested in um, looking at cross-validation as part of your, your project. This course is worth a read. And, and of course, the references in that paper would be good reading as well. OK, any questions on cross-validation before we move on? Good way or bad way to choose the grouping because it changes Q squared. Yeah. And I remember the plot you drew that R squared goes up and Q squared gets kind of a yeah. convex curve. Right. So. So we'll talk about that in today's class uh, later on. But one, the, my answer to you will be, <coughs> you will choose that grouping depending on what you're doing. Okay. So maybe not a not a satisfactory answer. If you have no if you have no particular initial objective with your data set, just choosing a random grouping would be probably the better strategy. So that you don't bias it in any way. But one way to see it is that if I chose my grouping one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I'm taking <coughs> I'm, I'm interleaving my rows like that. And my testing data is being brought in later on. So let's say I'm I'm working on Group two is the group that's left out. So I've skipped, I've used row one, I've used row three, I've used row four, and I leave out rows two and five. But if my data were time ordered, there would be really no benefit in, in dropping out group two because I'm leaving out group two and I'm building a model on, on rows one, three, four, six. But group two, uh, row two and row five over here, they really just they, they're interleaved between the data I have used to build my model. So if I'm building my PLS model to be able to predict in the future on my process, so I'm like two three months from now, and I want to test how well my model will work, this may this will give me an over optimistic estimate of how things work. A better grouping would be to use my initial data and then test it on the subsequent data because that matches more closely my objective of what I want to use the model for. So if you didn't quite get that, we will come back to that topic later on. But that's my, my key point. That your choice of row ordering should be influenced by your objective for the model. And I can see two, the same data set being cross-validated in two different ways depending on how I want to use it later on. So uh, just to clarify, the people who are opposed to the cross-validation just uh, are proponents of a separate validation set entirely. That's right. It's independent. Okay. And, and, and I'll emphasize that in today's class as well, in the soft sensor section. Because full soft sensors, that is usually what we want to do. We want to build a model now to use in the future. So if I'm going to interleave my data like this, I'm going to definitely get an over-optimistic estimate of my model's performance. OK, 
Okay, and in the uh, last class we, we started to look at a case study towards the end of the day on looking at the score plots, which we interpret in exactly the same way as we saw in the CA. You look at the T plots, you can look at the U plots, you can look at clusters within the scores, you can look for trends if you plot T as a time series. Nothing's changed. All the same tools that you've used color coding the score plots, which we've seen in the previous class as well. You can do that also in PLS. We also look at the weights plots, the W star plots, to understand the relationships in the X space. We look at the C plots to understand the relationships in the Y space, and if we superimpose those two plots, recall W star C here refers to W star superimposed on C. This is not W times C. It's a very unfortunate notation. Uh, I, I tend to actually use the, the uh, letter R for W star, but I don't want to use that in this course because almost every journal publication you read uses W star, so you're going to be confused with it by that. I do prefer writing R times C using my R for W star, but journal publications have unfortunately settled on to that very bad form of notation. So anyway, superimpose the W star plot on the C plot and you get a, this extremely powerful plot. This to me is the most useful plot in the PLS where you see how X variables relate to Y. And if you've got a good understanding of your process, you can almost start to see what changes in X cause and changes in Y. We can't always determine cause and effect in PLS. We'll talk about that next class. But if you've got a good understanding of your process, you can learn quite a bit here. Um, we've got SPE plots, T squared plots, and I just want to take a look at these next two plots. We didn't have a chance to cover them last class, um, but then we, we also get R squared plots, which uh, we've seen either bar plots for the overall uh, space or for uh, a bar plot for all the variables within the X space. Okay, so let's just quickly take a look at coefficient plots and VIP plots, and then we'll take a break and look at some sensors. Okay, so VIP, variable importance to prediction. And the question here, where, this, where this, uh, the need for this plot comes, is if we've got a component model where let's say A is equal to five. So we've got five components determined by cross-validation. If we wanted to understand the relationship between the variables, we'd have to look at W star 1 versus W star 2, 1 versus 3, 2 versus uh, 4, uh, sorry, 1 versus 4, 1 versus 5, and we've got 2 versus 3, etc. We've got lots of combinations to go through from a 2D perspective to try and learn a bit more about our process. Okay. So even though PLS is reducing the size of our problem, if there's more than a handful of components, we still got a lot of work to go and do to try and understand the, the relationships between the variables. And one of the things we look for in a W star C plot are the variables that are far away from the center. Okay? Why is that? Harry? Think of even even not think of PLS, think of even PCA in a loading plot. What, what does a large loading or a large weight mean? No, well, sorry, we're dealing in the in the loading space. We're not in the we're not in the observation direction. We're not looking from the variables. So let's say we've got a group and we've got many <coughs> variables in our model. So K, let's say is, is twenty. So in this loading plot, we would have twenty particular loadings, and let's say we've got a few here that are small and we've got a couple that are large, why is it that we take, pay attention to the large loadings and not the small loadings, or the large weights and not the small weights? What's your model? And what's your model for? Yeah, the fact that they represent something that appeared to be there. That's so there. Something. But the other way to see it is if you go back to the Niepels algorithm up here, when we're regressing, in this case, we're regressing the column of U onto X, and W represents the regression slope. In PCA, we regress 
weights P. So PCM, we've got an X matrix, we've got a T vector, and we've got a P vector. When we're regressing onto a particular column on X, we're regressing the T column, uh, sorry, we're regressing that column of X onto T and storing that regression coefficient in P. It represents the slope of this column from X, X subscript K, onto that score TA. And so if we have a particular column that has a small regression slope, so in other words the value of PA is roughly zero, it's basically saying the relationship between the variables between that column of X and that score is <coughs> right? So the best regression coefficient that we can fit there is, is a line that's roughly zero, plus or minus some error. Okay? And that, when we plot it in the weight plot, or in the loading plot, will appear here at the center. So these variables near the center are variables in the loadings plot from uh, PCA or in the weights plot from PLS that really play no role in component one and component two. So if I'm plotting W star one versus two, or P1 versus P2 for PCA, variables here near the center I can disregard because they don't play a role in that particular component. Same for PLS. And we get that from, from the Eaton's uh, concept that those, those loadings and those weights are really just slope coefficients from the regressions inside the Eaton's. So we're really not interested in small values over here. Now this particular variable, let's say 13, while it may not be big in component one and two, it may play an important role in the third component. Okay, so if I had to plot W star two versus W star three now, this whole picture will change and variables that might be at the center over here now move to the outside and become important in another component because the first two components explain the major source of variation. Variable 13 might only be, be not as important as the others, but it is important in a later component. Is there a question? But is it, is it uh, smart to say that we could just disregard them all together because the different components contribute uh, like smaller variation altogether? That's an excellent point, right? The third component <coughs> explains less overall variation in the model than the first and the second component. So not only do we have to take into account the fact that this particular variable, x13, is not important in the first two components, but it might become important in the third component. But let's say that third component, component only explains 2% of the overall model. Is it still an important variable? No, okay. And that's exactly what VIP is doing. It's the variable importance to, of all the variables over all components in the model. So VIP tries to say, how important is a variable? What does it have a large weight? And does it come from a component that's got a, that's well explained? So if you had a variable that has low weights in all components, that variable is not important in the model at all. Okay? Basically, that would be like a column of putting a column of random numbers into your model and hoping that it fits something it's going to get low weights over all components because there's enough. The, the, it can't be explained by the X space, it can't be explained by the Y space, it can't be explained between X and Y. So it's going to get low weights in all components. Okay. Furthermore, there's no good having a large weight from a component that overall isn't important at all, that only explains a small amount of variance. <laughs> and so the calculation for VIP tries to combine those two things. It takes the sum of squares of x from one component to the next. So this is basically telling you how well this eighth component here, how much sum of squares is being explained by that component, multiplies it by the w weight squared, because we're really only interested in the absolute magnitude of the w, whether it's positive a large positive or a large negative. So we square that up. And we sum over all, all the components, one, two, three, four, in this case, five. So 
So it's going to calculate a weighted sum of that loading value over all components and, and weighted by the variance explained by the particular component. Yeah. Is this W star squared? This is W. This is W. This is w yeah. And we then ratio it out at the front here by the sum of squares where we, which we started with before putting any components over the sum of squares that we end up with y at the end. And really what these two <coughs> terms are over here and here, uh, they really are just r squared. Uh, but they only take the numerator portion of, of each term. So this is the numerator of r squared for the a component. This over here is the r squared for the entire model uh, because the sum of squares of x that we started off with uh, is cancels out on the numerator. And it's a bit, uh, it's actually extremely messy, but you can show that the sum of squares of the VIP values, so what I've plotted over, written over here is the VIP value squared. If I add those up, they add up to k, the number of variables in my model. So it's quite reasonable then to say if my variable k, my k variable in my model, if it has a VIP value greater than one, it's contributing its own weight and a little bit more to the overall model. Okay, because the sum of the VIP squared must add up to what, uh, k. A variable with a VIP less than one is, is not contributing its own weight to the model. It's really, it, and you could say even a variable that, that's basically a form of random numbers would get a VIP close to zero because its loadings would be small and it doesn't really matter what these sums of squares are because it's got small weights. Okay, so a, a column of random numbers will have a VIP close to zero. And VIP, is, I, I don't have it here, VIP is always the number at least greater than zero. Okay, from this definition that should be apparent. So VIPs are number always greater than zero, and we look for value for columns which have VIP greater than one as being important overall. Now, don't go and say, well, columns with VIP less than one, I'm gonna remove them from the model and delete them. That's not right, because you're <coughs> always gonna find columns with VIP less than one. By definition, the sum of the VIPs must add up to K, the number of variables in your, in your model. So you have to have some that are below and some that are above. Okay. And so for the LDPE data set we looked at in last class, remember that was the data set where you had 14 variables that defined how that polymer reactor worked. We had five variables in our Y space. So by plotting VIP, we can see, well, the inlet temperature, the maximum temperature at zone one and zone two, as well as these variables, Z1 and Z2, which is where the hot spot occurred in the reactor. Those are the variables that play the largest role in the model. That's, about, that's what the VIP plot is saying. Finding the variables which play an important role in the model. These variables here, the inlet temperature of the coolant in zone one, in zone two, and the flow rate of the solvent in zone two, they have very small VIP. They're not well explained by the model. They have small weights in all components. Uh, that's the only way you can get a small VIP. If you look back at the formula here for VIP, the only way you can get a small value is by having small Ws. All these, this is the sum of squares in the X matrix, the entire X matrix, with A minus one components. So you can't change these by, about the model. The only thing that can change from one column to the next is its weight. So small VIP means that that column is not, has a small weight over all components. The nice thing is that this captures what all these loading plots, or, or it captures some of the information that you would have seen had you gone through all these loading plots. Okay. It obviously doesn't capture which variables are, are correlated and negatively correlated with each other. That's the, that the only way you can get that is by looking at a 2D plot. But on this 1D plot, this one dimensional data set, we're really just seeing which variables are large in magnitude over all of the five components in one go. So we don't have to flip through all the combinations. Okay. Now, the coefficient plot does exactly <coughs> the same thing, um, but it does it for a different quantity. 
So I had this up earlier. Here we said we can get our y hats by saying t times c transpose, or if we substitute the definition for t, which is x times w star, we can now relate our x to our y in one go. Okay? And what we, we call this w star c term, this is not w times c, this is w star multiplied by c transpose. That we call our regression coefficient matrix beta. Because what it's doing is it's doing exactly what we expect of a regression coefficient. It's multiplying, let's just take the case for a single y. It's just saying y hat is equal to x1 times beta 1 plus x2 times beta 2 up to the last variable, so xk beta k. So for one particular column of y, these regression coefficients beta are what we multiply the x mu by in order to get our prediction of y. And as I say, I never implement PLS in this way. There's a good reason, because you don't get your SPE, you don't get your t squared. If you bypass, if you jump straight from x to y, you don't get all the good, good advantages of PLS, right? You can't handle this data. You don't get your t squared, you don't get your sp. So this is no good for implementing PLS. Though many software packages do this, unfortunately. But what we do use it for is we try to understand which variables are important <coughs> to this particular y. Okay. So remember the x's here have all been pre-processed and centered and scaled. So these betas represent by how much we multiply the corresponding x to get y hat. You had a question? Oh, well, not really. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay. So, <coughs> so we, there is some cautions regarding interpreting this. You can't interpret them independently, right? You, if beta 1 is greater than beta 2, it's not necessarily, you can't say x1 um, is more important than x2. But it does show us on a relative scale how important different variables are over all components to predicting y. That's the other nice thing about the betas is that, remember, we had to calculate the t's by calculating t1, then deflating, go to t2, t3, t4, and so on. What beta does is it captures all of that information in w star and in the c matrix in one particular vector and tells us how to get to y. And so if we looked at the regression coefficient plotted for one of our y variables in the LDP data set from last week, one of the y variables was conversion. And what I've done here is I've, I've plotted the axes, ro axes rotated here, I'm putting my x variable on my y axis, and I'm showing the, co the coefficients here, their magnitude and, and sign, some are positive, some are negative, and I've sorted them from, from lowest to highest. Okay. So, Immediately we can see that for conversion, it's got a negative regression coefficient for the inlet temperature. And it's got a large positive regression coefficient for the T max 2 and the flow rate of the initiator. So if we were wanted to increase conversion, what might we do? And what would we do to the inlet temperature at Z2 is to decrease that. Okay. Now, this is the coefficient plot over all components. Over all, um, I think there were five components by cross validation in this one. I could have got that information by plotting a W star C plot. So let's say here's my <coughs> C variable for conversion over here. So there's my, my, uh, my w, so I'm plotting a W star C plot now. There's my C value, my weight for my Y space for conversion. And I could look at W star 1 versus 2 and see, well, conversion is negatively correlated with inlet temperature and positively correlated with T max 2. So I would expect on this W star C1 plot to find T in over here, because it's got, they've got a negative correlation. And I would expect to find T max 2 over here, because Tmax2 is positively correlated with conversion. 
But if I put five components, I have to go look through all of W star one, two, three, four, and five to, to see that. And it would be hard to keep track of the relationships amongst all the variables over all those plots. Okay. To see, well, they're positively correlated here, and in yes, in W star C2 versus three, they're still positively correlated. So the coefficient plot is a great summary of all by weight plots, correlation relationships. That's what we use this sort of one. There's a, a, a different way of looking at it here. What I've done is now I've plotted on a variable by variable basis. So these are all the coefficients for Tn, and there's five bars here because in the y space there were five variables. So there was conversion, number average molecular weight, weight average molecular weight, LCB, and, and SCB. So there were five y variables. So sometimes some of the software will show you the coefficients for the inlet temperature x variable for all of the five y's. The coefficients for T max one for all of the five y's. This might be a little bit of a harder plot to read. But it's a, so basically what this conversion plot is here on the previous screen is I've just picked out the bars corresponding to the conversion y variable and I've sorted them from high to low. So just different ways of looking at the same. Okay, one final slide to look, to talk about, and then we'll just take a break. This is this concept of jackknifing. And again, anyone who's looking for an interesting research topic, this could be could be one. It's more of a theoretical topic. <coughs> one one thing we have when we do cross validation over here, we've split our data set into G groups. Okay, and every grouping, group one, group two, group three, we calculate a set of we calculate a complete model, right? We calculate W's, we calculate C's, we calculate P's, we calculate beta regression coefficients, we calculate PIP values, we calculate R squareds. Every, every time we fit one of these models, we calculate a full P, PLS model. And we could, if we wanted to, go and look at those, those PLS models coefficients over here, right? So we build model one, we build model two, three, four, five, six, and say we do that seven times. We really are getting G plus one estimates of each of these coefficients or matrices. And I, the reason why it's G plus one is because we do G times, and then the plus one is the last time we, we actually do it on all the data together, and that's the actual model that's reported to you in the software. So, we get G plus one estimates of the loadings and of all these other terms over there. So what we could go do is, we could go and plot, I don't want to use the word confidence intervals, but you'll sometimes see that in the software. They're not true confidence intervals. But you'll sometimes see on, let's take this VIP plot. They'll draw little error bars here on the VIP plot, because those are, the bounds of the VIPs found for this variable over the G plus one calculations. So they stored the, the G plus one values of, from the VIP plot for every variable, and they can kind of draw little error bars for you over there. A better term for that would be reliability intervals. Okay? Because let's say you take this variable and its VIP is something so the range of the VIPs found for the flow rate of solvent in section two of the reactor span that range. That's very wide. It's telling you that there's a lot of you get a lot of variation depending on which round of the cross validation you're in. If I had a very tight reliability interval over there, it would indicate to me that that. <coughs> FI2 variables, VIP values, are pretty stable from one group to the next group to the next group. Okay. So you'll sometimes see those reported in the software, and I just wanted to, to point out where they come from. It's from this, these cross-validation rounds. So that's another advantage of the cross-validation. If you had a data that built like five or six or seven individual models, right. could you then have like a real confidence interval, like a true confidence interval? Uh, you, the, the problem is that confidence, though, the meaning of confidence interval in a statistical sense 
comes from a different derivation, a different set of assumptions. So okay. it's really not fair to call them confidence models. Okay. Right. I think I, I like the terminology reliability interval because it's, it's more descriptive of what, how you should use it. Okay, so let's take a quick break here, 10 minutes.